Hello and welcome to this week's prayer service of the Servants Entrance Community. Please join us in our opening song. Hello, I'm Dr. Mary Dumb, the pastoral associate at St. Blaise Catholic Church in Sterling Heights. It's my honor to be with you today. Today, as we celebrate the solemnity of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The human body has over 30 trillion human cells of about 200 different types working together to make the body function. Just think of it. 30 trillion separate entities, each performing the function it was made to do, each different because of its purpose, and yet the same at a basic level. Nerve cells, for instance, are long in shape so they can transmit information. And heart cells have an increased ability to produce energy so they can keep the heart beating yet both contain the same basic interior structures that enable them to live. No one cell, or even cell type, could be said to be the most important. Indeed, without the others with which it lives in community, any single cell would most certainly not survive. Each cell in that 30 trillion or so collection has special abilities that enable it to carry out its function in keeping the whole body alive. Each cell has a lifespan during which it does what it was made to do for the greater good of the whole. The human family has many fewer members than the 30 trillion cells inside each person, but each was made by a loving creator and given special abilities that make each different from other members and yet the same at a basic level. Each human has the same needs and emotions but each was given special talents and gifts that helped to contribute to a greater whole. Each member was called by a loving creator to function for a specific purpose, to be what he or she was created to be, for the good of the whole human family. No one human, or his or her gifts, can be said to be more important than another, for each was created to contribute to the whole of humanity. Ah, if only we could see our interconnectedness as our own bodies recognize the cells within them. If only we could see that just as the lowly skin cell is just as important as the nerve cell to the function of our bodies, so the lowly family living in a small room in a motel because they have no other home to go to is just as important as the executive living in a million dollar home in the gated community. If only we could see that, 
just as the white blood cell has a place among the cells of the body, so does the migrant worker picking beans have a place among the members in the body of Christ. Can we stand beside the lowly, just as our cells stand beside each other, and see the worth of each one? Because just as the food we eat is broken down into pieces that become the building blocks of the cells that make up our human bodies, the body of Christ we share at the table connects us as members in a larger human network that are the muscles and nerves of Jesus in our world today, reaching out to all. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you living among us in the sacrament of your holy body and blood. May we offer to our Father in heaven a solemn pledge of undivided love. May we offer to our sisters and brothers a life poured out in loving service of that kingdom where you live with the Father and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Genesis. Melchizedek, ruler of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and being a priest of God most high, Melchizedek blessed Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God who delivered your enemies into your hands. The word of God. A proclamation of Psalm 104. Our second reading is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I received from God what I passed on to you, namely, that our Savior Jesus Christ, on the night of betrayal, took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this as a memorial to me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
whenever you drink it, do it as a memorial of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of Christ until the second coming. The Word of God. Please rise in body or spirit for the gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus spoke to the crowds about the reign of God and healed all who were in need of healing. As sunset approached, the twelve came and said to Jesus, Dismiss the crowds, they can go into the surrounding villages and countrysides and find lodging and food. But this is a remote and an isolated area. But Jesus answered them, Give them something to eat yourselves. The disciples replied, We have nothing but five loaves and two fish. Or do you want us to go out and buy food for all these people? There were about 5,000 gathered. Jesus said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of 50 or so. They did so and got them all seated. And then, Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said a blessing over them, broke them and gave them to the disciples for distribution to the crowd. They all ate until they were full. And when the leftovers were collected, there were 12 baskets full. The Gospel of the Lord. Happy Feast of the Solemnity of the Body and Blood of Christ. This is one of the few times in the year where we take a break from a reading of the gospel and look at a theological belief. All right, there's just a few times that we do this, but they're important ones we want to accent. And of course, the Eucharist, the body and blood of our Lord is central to the faith. But how shall we look at it? Um, there are many ways. It's kind of like looking in a kaleidoscope, right? You look up at the light and you see all these different shapes and colors, just depending how you turn it just a little bit or how the light shifts behind it. So what shall we talk about? Shall we talk about the body and blood and the real presence of our Lord and this gift to us? Shall we talk about the blessed sacrament? or the Holy Communion, or a meal, or a sacrifice, what shall we talk about today? I bring this out because there are a myriad of ways of looking at the Eucharist, and that's a good thing. 
Um, it gives us a depth of faith and allows us to have multiple ways of approaching this most holy sacrament. But I want to talk about that second reading. The reading from 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. Um, and I'm also a teacher, and so I got to give you homework by the time we're done. You see, this reading is the same one we heard on Holy Thursday. It is the institution of the Eucharist, which we recognize. We hear it almost word for word in the Eucharistic prayer every Sunday. But uh, this is the oldest story of the Last Supper. St. Paul predates the Gospels, right? And St. Paul tells a story in a particular context, which I think is important for the church today. Um, in fact, St. Paul, in order to understand him, you need to know not only the context that this is the beginning of, but this is part of a longer um, three, four chapters of almost a sermon or even a tirade, because Paul is pretty angry when he says these words. And why? Because there were divisions in the church. Shocking. If you thought divisions were something new to the 21st century, They've been here since the very beginning. Even before there were gospels, there were divisions in the church. And Paul is angry about that. He's angry at the people of Corinth that they missed the most important thing. And that is the holy communion that they are. Now remember, they're in house churches, right? And so they're gathering in someone's home every single week to share a meal, to tell the story, to do the Eucharist part. Well, in the intro to the section, St. Paul talks about how their do gatherings are doing more harm than good, he says, because they gather with the wrong attitude. Some are getting there earlier and starting their meal earlier. And to quote St. Paul, some are going hungry while others are getting drunk. Well, some were rich. They didn't have to get there later. They got there earlier, as a matter of fact, and pre-partied while the laborers came later. This is not the intent of the Eucharist. And in that anger, he says, don't you remember that on the night before he died? And he tells a story not new, but something they should know in their heart of hearts, something they do week in and week out. Do they not realize what they are doing? And then he says words that follow this passage, and this is why I want you to read the whole thing, that tells them they should judge themselves, not others. Do they recognize the body when they gather? I keep reading because in Catholic land, you know, in Christian land, we start thinking, oh, yeah, the bread, they don't understand what the bread is. They don't understand real presence. Well, that's important. That's not what Paul's talking about. Because, you see, Paul's talking about the body of Christ that is gathered. Like, do you not get the message? of both the Eucharist that you share and the share the community that you are. Chapter 12 is going to go into the famous passage of the image of the body. The body is one and has many members and all the members, many though they are, are one body. And so Christ. We need our eyes and our ears. In fact, he gives us two memos for us to think about, right? On one hand, I can say, well, I'm an ear. Look at me, I hear everything. But we still need eyes to see. The ear isn't all that without an eye. But on the other hand, the eye can't say, I'm only an eye. They don't really need me. No. All parts of the body are essential. And he goes on to even say that the ones we think are less important are the ones we should look at as more important. The entire body is essential, and so we are the body of Christ. Every piece of us is essential. Everyone is essential. 
We need to recognize our own goodness and our own giftedness that we bring to the body of Christ. God made each one of us, and we are essential to the mission and to the community. So if we're feeling like we're unimportant, maybe we need to work on that and sit with the Lord and see our giftedness and get rid of those little mind things that are telling us we're unimportant. And if we think we're so important because we got these really special gifts, take it down an image, take it down a moment, leave your ego at the door, you are no important than the person sitting next to you. That may be our challenge. And then he goes on to his probably the most famous passage of all. In the same context that began with the story of the Last Supper, now comes back to the poem on love. I know he used it so many weddings. Not about married love, though of course married love would be included in this, but the love that the community is to have for one another. Yes, they will know we are Christians by our love. The love that is patient and love is kind. It does not brood over injuries. In fact, in the end, there are three things that last, faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love. The greatest is love. And it beats out any of these other gifts we might feel so good about. As sisters and brothers, to understand the Eucharist in St. Paul, you need to understand this whole thing. So how do we understand Eucharist today? In the divisiveness of our world. In the divisiveness within churches and even within families, whether they be blood families or intentional families, we seem to struggle with difference and turn it into division. Yes, all are welcome, but once people walk in the door, how do we treat folks? Do we really accept each other's gifts? Now, some of us come to this message going, yeah, they didn't like me because, that's a hurt we need to get over. It's real, we need to own it. We need to understand the pain it has brought us. And we need to understand the walls that may still be in front of us that stop us from being who we are in the community. That's real, we can't erase it. However, we cannot let it define us because God is the only one who defines us and we spend a lifetime figuring out the giftedness God sees in us. So heal if that's where you're at today. Take one more baby step toward putting down that baggage. And then the question, of course, is how do we see others who come sit around the round table? Where's our judgment zones? Who do we think shouldn't be here because? And maybe it's the ones who have hurt us first. Maybe we think they shouldn't be able to sit with us. Maybe they've done all these terrible sins. They're not allowed in. Ooh, ooh. Then we become just like the people who hurt us first. So let's lay that down and stop that cycle. Let us be what we received, the Eucharist given freely to all, the very body and blood of our Lord that we receive that courses through our veins. We are called to be Christ's body and blood in this world. We are the shining light. God has given us the wisdom to understand this truth just a little bit. And the ability to be a community that shines forth that believes in things like forgiveness and healing and all really are welcome at this table. The Lord invited every one of us to sit equally. Not the same, thank God, but in a beautiful rainbow of diversity that shines in this world and can heal all this division. So let us share 
the body and blood of Christ. And let us be the body and blood of Christ to a world that so needs it. Let us show that there are ways that all really can be welcome at every table. And that all of us can continue to grow and understand the blessedness that God put in the world when we arrived. This is our feast, the feast of the gift given and the feast of the community gathered. So you've got your homework if you choose to accept it. Second half of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Paul's long sermon on division and unity in the body of Christ. May we really be the Christians that they know by our love. Amen. And so we offer our prayers to the Lord. We pray for our church, for all the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ and people of goodwill, that we may live in truth and peace and justice and reach out beyond walls to build a world of safety and love. We pray to the Lord. We pray also for our world we are mindful of our sisters and brothers in Ukraine, in Nigeria, in all places where violence is more prevalent than peace. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all who today know more sorrow than joy, more pain than solace, for all who struggle with illness of body, mind, or spirit. We pray to the Lord. For what else shall we pray? For these prayers and all that remain in the silence of our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Gathering our prayers and praise into one, we join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray together. Most loving God, we thank you for our calling and nurturing in each of us a disciple's heart, a heart that rejoices in your promptings, a heart sustained by your spirit, and a heart encouraged by the support and love of our sisters and brothers. God, you offer us new beginnings. Fill us with confidence in our work. May our efforts extend beyond the threshold of our homes, out through the servant's entrance, to a world so desperately in need of hope and healing. Dream your dream in us, that in this house church, your vision and direction will take shape in us and we will be transformed by your spirit. May your presence in what we do encourage us to dare, and may solidarity and togetherness be our strength. We make this prayer in your name with Jesus the Christ and your Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join us for our closing song. So glad you're in my